Ryan talked about making extensions. Um, and when, after you make your extension, um, you're going to want to use your extension in, in your Python code. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about how to write the objects that uh, you'll work with in, in your Python code. Um, so before I do that, um, I'm just give an overview of this sort of software architecture so you know where it fits in. Um, you may have heard us talk about uh, these things called containers, um, but if not, just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So this is sort of the overall architecture of, of HDMF, this underlying package that, that PyNWB was built on. Um, and this is just a, it's a details of how we've, we've separated all these different components of this uh, data standard. Um, so we have this sort of standard specification interfaces. We have these IO backend, we separated that. Uh, so I say, yeah, we, we may support ZAR someday, or we, um, right now it's sort of in beta, um, but we've, point is we've separated out the specification, this IO backend, or the storage backend, um, but uh, your user code should focus on, you know, these container objects, or, or manipulate and work with container objects. Um, so, you know, the point of this, this talk is to figure out how do you, how do you write these, these this, the objects that exist in this, this layer, just to give um, uh, more uh, uh, details into like how this may, may fit in. So the container goes through this, uh, this, this mapping layer into this intermediate layer called builders, and then the HTMFIO layer converts that, that abstract representation into the storage backend. So we're going to talk about how to make these. So what, are, what exactly are containers? So they represent data. Um, they're really just these objects for working with your data. And because your data is complex, and sometimes to make storage more efficient, we have to do unintuitive things. We've made this, added this layer to sort of shield you from those complicated, maybe unintuitive things uh, that we have to do to store it. So they sort of insulate you from the complexities of data storage. And so the point is just provide this stable interface um, for, for you to program against. Um, and part of this is also a way to define like how your, your data type behaves. So what I mean by that is you know, providing some common routines for, for accessing data or maybe transforming data um, and they can live on these container objects. Uh, there's sort of two ways to get container objects. You can use this auto generation method called get class. I think Ryan mentioned that, and um, that that works for getting started. Um, but then you may want to uh, write your own, and that's how we're gonna. What I'm gonna talk about today is some features we have in the API that make writing your own classes easier. This get class method um, auto generates a class from your specification, um, your YAML files. So this is a great way to get started, but it's based on the specification and doesn't, which doesn't, def which defines the data model. It doesn't actually define the functionality of your class. It's great for getting started, but it's not reproducible. It's not sustainable. Every time you change something about your extension, then that means the class and the, the part that's supposed to be stable for your program against will also change. Um, so for the long term, uh, we suggest writing your own class using get class as a way to get started, um, <clears throat> but then eventually move to having your own API code. Um, so how do you do that? Um, PyNWB has these container objects, um, well, really HTMF, um, but uh, you know, PyNDB sits on top of HTMF, so. And these containers have a couple decorators that you'll need to be familiar with, um, and then I call meta class directives. So these are sort of class properties, class attributes that you set, and it will auto generate functionality and code for you. So the first decorator to become familiar with is this thing called docfail. Um, so it's a decorator for auto generating doc strings and checking arguments. Um, it, it takes in a list of dictionaries that describe the, each argument to, to a function, and so name, type, and doc. Um, so obviously the name is the name of the argument, and then type defines what type it is, uh, and the doc 
or is the, uh, the, the argument document string or documentation string. And then additionally, you can specify a default argument. If you say default, it will create an argument that uh, is actually a keyword argument. And then the function functions that use docval always need to take star star kwargs or just one uh, kwargs uh, dictionary as the arguments. And then on top of docval or with docval, you can use this other function called getargs to extract arguments. And so that's a lot of information. And here's an example of how all this, this uh, gets used. So here I have my class uh, object and I've got a method that I've defined for that class. And uh, I've defined these these uh, two arguments that are required. Um, so arg1, arg2, the first one is a string, the second one's an int, and then this is a documentation string uh, for those arguments. Uh, and then third, I've defined this optional argument, and it's optional because I have a default that I can use. And now I want to use that in this method. And so I, uh, oh, yes, these are passed in through the uh, kwargs argument, so everything's going to come in as a dictionary or in this in this dictionary, and then uh, this getargs function serves as a this sort of convenience method for pulling arguments out of uh, the kwargs dictionary. So the one thing to know is if you want to just use docfail on a function that's not a method, uh, you'll have to specify is method equals false, um, because every method you have to pass in uh, self as the first argument, and uh, docfail needs to account for that. So. so sometimes you may find yourself extending classes, and uh, you need to call the super method, and a lot of the um, a lot of the, the arguments are the same in the super, method, super class method as they are in the subclass method. And docfail is a really, or call docfail func provides this uh, wrapper function for, for taking care of a lot of that boilerplate, extracting the arguments and then passing it into the function. Um, <clears throat> so call docfail func just works by passing in some function. So this uh, method one, which we defined um, in my class previous slide, uh, and then the kwargs, the dictionary that contains all the arguments. Um, the nice thing about this is if I add a, um, uh, a function or a, an argument to the my class method one, it this sort of takes care of extracting that argument and then passing it in uh, during the function call. So, so NWB container. So pretty much everything in the PyWB uh, interface or API is a subclass of NWB container. So really a container is this collection of data, metadata, and sort of other collections. Everyone will inevitably work with NWB file. Um, this is, uh, this is a, an NWB container. Um, uh, and as I said, this sort of is a, provides a stable class. Um, yeah, so you can auto-generate properties with this or for these these container objects using um, this class attribute called uh, NW fields or under under underscore underscore NW fields. There's a couple different uh, versions or subclasses of NWB container that we've had to incorporate into the API to make things more flexible. Um, one of them is NWB data, and then um, this next one is, the other one is NWB data interface. Um, whether or not you're using NWB container, NWB data interface, or NWB data, um, the next slide, or the next, uh, all these, these things should um, uh, apply. And eventually I'll talk about multi-container interface. Um, which has some additional functionality for auto-generating sub-containers of, of a container. Um, okay, so here's an example of uh, an NWB data interface, or which is an NWB container. And I think Oliver used this uh, cortical surface extension uh, as an example in, in 
an earlier talk. Um, and so this cortical surface uh, container exists or consists of two data sets, um, faces and vertices. And so we want to, this, this cortical surface object, we want to be able to access faces and vertices eventually. Um, and so this will, this auto generates some properties uh, of this class in this, this constructor method. Um, we passed in to the name, which is kind of a, a requirement of an end of B container. And then the faces and vertices arguments. Um, one thing to note here is that this doc val, uh, the, the doc val decorator um, can use these things, we, these macros. Um, so this just says that faces can come in as any form of an array data or of array data. So a list or a NumPy uh, array and data, I think, specifies that it can be any sort of numerical value. So the thing that you get by that, that using NWB fields and not just using the syntax without NWB fields does is under the hood, what this is actually doing is generating a, uh, a property that can only be set once. Um, so this is sort of a mechanism to keep your data immutable in memory. So once this, once this object gets constructed, um, we pull out the data from our uh, that were passed in, and then we set this property here. And so that's what NWB fields, using NWB fields will get you as opposed to writing your own. Um, we'll create these properties that can only be set once. So finally, for PyNWB to know that this class corresponds to this neurodata type cortical surface, we have to register that with the API. And that's where this PyNWB register class decorator comes in. Um, so it knows when it reads a neurodata type called cortical surface, it knows to use this cortical surface object to represent that data. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about multi-container interface. Uh, so this is a, an NWB data interface that contains one or more of a certain type. So the canonical example I use is LFP, and I will, um, but there are plenty of uh, examples of this throughout the API, um, like NWB file, which contains plenty of time series, uh, acquisition time series, and stimulus time series, etc. Image segmentation contains many instances of plane segmentation. And multi-container interface um, using, uh, so it also has NWB fields, but it also has this other uh, class attribute called class conf. And this can be used to auto-generate lots of setters and getter methods for adding all these sub-container types to the object. So like I said, LFP um, is what I think is for this canonical or this uh, simple example. So an LFP contains lots of electrical series and you may you know, want to have all these methods for adding these electrical series objects to this container. And instead of writing those all by hand, um, you can just pass in or define this, this class property called class conf, and it will auto generate these methods for you. So, so the next container I'll talk about is dynamic table. And this is sub or subclasses of dynamic table are kind of all over the specification. So the units units are stored in a, in a dynamic table. Electrodes are stored in a dynamic table. And this is a column centric table, which means columns are stored as individual data sets. So the implication of that is we can add additional data sets or additional columns dynamically. So that's where this the term dynamic table comes from. Uh, epochs and trials are also dynamic tables. But you may want to have some predefined columns and this dunder dunder columns and dunder dunder default name provide some functionality for auto generating and defining defaults for a dynamic table. I think it's easy just to show an example here. And so units, this is the table for storing information about spike units. 
Um, as I said, these columns are defined by this under under columns class property. And so sort of like docvale, it takes in a list of dictionaries and the name key in those dictionaries defines the name of the column and then a uh, description provides some description of uh, what that, that column is. And this is sort of required as part of the, the, the standard storing appropriate metadata with data sets. So this is, this is a required thing as well. And as you see, there's index and table and these other keys, and I'll, I'll talk about those um, a couple slides. Um, <clears throat> so that's how you define columns. So that's adding extra data in one dimension and then populating all those columns. You have to use the add row method. Um, so here we've added an add unit method to units to, for doing some additional things. And this section you can see where we're, we're linking units to electrodes. Um, but as you see, the very first thing it does is call the add row method. More trickery to connect the spike unit to the electrodes if that was provided. So add row is how you populate the dynamic table. So the thing about dynamic table is it's not just sort of like a pandas data frame uh, where you have one value per cell, we support sort of higher order columns to exist in a dynamic table. And the three main ones here, well, vector data, this has this sort of one-to-one. -one. So <clears throat> this uh, can be any sort of n-dimensional column. And it says that for every row in your table, um, there's a fixed number of elements for every column. So the, the example in the units table is a waveform mean. And then alongside a vector data or a, an additional column type, you can use this vector index and this provides the way to do a one to many mapping from rows or elements in your table to uh, values that correspond to the columns. So the example here is uh, spike times. So you may have one unit um, in your table. Some units may have five spike times, and one unit may have 25 spike times, and this is handled using this vector index object. And you shouldn't really have to um, work with these objects directly, but um, the class comp provides ways about generating those. And thirdly, dynamic table region is uh, a way to connect two tables. Um, so units, the column uh, electrodes in the units table points to a different dynamic table. So if we go back to um, this example of units, um, this first column times, like I said, you can unit can have so there's a variable number of, of spike times per unit, um, and we indicate that with this, this key index equals true. So this tells um, the dynamic table to keep an index alongside this column and track the difference, uh, or the fact that there are different numbers of spike times per unit. Uh, and then as we see with electrodes, this, this column serves as a way to, to connect the spike unit to the electrode that um, recorded it. Um, and because you can have more than one electrode recording from a, sp a single spike, we've set this index to true. Um, but we also want to point to the electrode that uh, the electrodes table that recorded this spike uh, or this spike unit. And we use that with this key table equals true. But like I said, so waveform mean every uh, unit in the units table has the same number of, of values for the waveform mean, so you don't need to uh, add any additional keys for that. So 
you built your container and now it needs to go into the storage back end. So HDMF will do a lot of, and Pine to BD will do a lot of uh, things for you, but sometimes it might not do exactly what you want it to do. And so you need to sort of customize this part where it turns a container into this intermediate representation for storage. Um, and that's what this object mapping, these arrows are object mappers. Uh, and there's one object mapper for each class. This is sort of what they, at a high level, look like, or what they're doing. So this object mapper takes a specification, and based on the specification, it, it makes its best guess, um, or using a, a set of rules on how to extract data from your, your, uh, your Python object, um, your in-memory object, to this abstract, or this abstract layer uh, called builder. And so, if you're getting really sophisticated, you might want to want to write these, and that's what we'll talk about next. So this controls, like I said, the mapping between uh, the container and the, the builder. Um, really what it's working on is controls the mapping between object attributes, so like cortical surface dot vertices to the specification fields, which is also, you know, uh, maybe vertices in, in the, the spec. Um, and these things are constructed using the actual spec, and then it maps spec components to these container attributes. Um, it has some default rules for how it does this and how it um, actually pulls those values off the container to write them into uh, to storage. Um, but you may want to customize those. And so uh, there are three main things you may need you know, that you'll need to know about if you're going to go about customizing uh, this behavior. The first is this instant method, instance method called map spec. And I'll show an example of how that's used about, uh, these are used in the next slide. Um, and then if you need to customize how uh, an attribute gets mapped into storage, you have this decorator called object attribute and you define specific functions for how you turn an attribute into storage ready form. And then you can also go the opposite way where if you have something stored on disk, and you don't like how it's represented in terms of how you want to use it in memory, you have this thing called constructor arg, this decorator called constructor arg that you can decorate functions with for how to transform stored data into in-memory data. And finally, you have this other, this higher level decorator called register map. So if you provide some custom object mapper, you have to tell the API that you've, you've built this and you wanted to use it and that's done with this pinedu.register map. Uh, okay, so here's um, a custom object mapper for time series and keep in mind this is a little old so there's probably more in there now. So as I said, um, there's this map spec method um, that actually wraps um, map attribute and map constructor arc. And so we've, in time series, we've modified both of, we've, we've defined, redefined different specifications, spec objects, and how they map to um, different class attributes. And so that's what these two different method calls are. And then, uh, so as you, here's constructor arg, where we've defined a different way to pull the name off of the the builder, the abstract rep representation of uh, the time series object. So this is a little in depth and high level, or not, not high level. But as you as you go down this adventure of um, defining new objects, um, you might want to customize things, and it's just good to be. We would like you to know that this is how this is what exists, um, and that you have the functionality to control how these things get mapped to and from disk. Oh, yes, and finally you need to register this object mapper with, with the system, so. Okay. So, in summary, there are two main things here. Um, you can create different in-membrane representations. The base classes are 
NWB container, NWB data, and dynamic table. And you can find more uh, about these base classes here. You can extend any class, uh, including time, like for example, time series, if you want to create a new time series object. Um, I think that's what most of you will start extending. And then just you have these decorated and meta class directives to auto generate code and register the find UV system. And then finally, if you uh, want to modify how data gets stored, um, you have the customized mapping. Uh, you can customize the mapping of classes to storage, and that's with this object mapper classes. Um, I think that's it.